We're glad to be here today. We ought to always rejoice to be able to assemble with the saints. It's, it's really the next thing to heaven. You might not realize that. You may not think that way, but you ought to. Because where else is the world shut out and everything being done to the best of our ability as humans, the redeemed, the Christians, to glorify God and to do all things as he would have us do it. If I were to say any one thing, to deal with any one thing, to study any one thing that is probably more needful than the other about me or you as individuals becoming Christians and living the Christian life, I would say it is the matter of self-denial. How many people here really don't like yourselves? How many people live every day trying to oppose yourself? The truth of the matter is, we like self a whole lot. And that's a problem. The devil knows we like ourselves that way. And he says, there's one of the greatest tools I've ever had in my toolbox to get people to sin is because people love themselves. Nothing wrong with loving yourself as long as you learn to love yourself like God says you ought to love yourself. Most people don't. They just don't because they go about trying to satisfy self from the human appetites, not from self as God says on the spiritual level. Listen to what is said in by Jesus in Mark, uh, Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and verse number 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now that sentiment, to one extent or another, is set out in the whole Bible and repeated and applied in so many different ways. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. That word let carries with it the, the, the force of a command. You must deny yourself if you will really and genuinely follow Jesus. You must. You cannot follow Jesus except that you deny yourself and follow him. This is the idea that's presented in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Unless you deny yourself the appetites of the flesh, the, the things you like about you, and the gratification of what you like and you want to do, you'll never obey Matthew 6, 33. And there are so many passages in the Bible that teach that point. Going back to the Old Testament, book of Proverbs, chapter 25, and verse 28, you'll see there that already, and had been for a long, long time before that, men have been taught that you have your own personal will, thus you can control yourself. Verse 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now you know how it was in those days. The cities, uh, to protect themselves, had walls built around them. People tended to live in the cities and go out into the countryside during the day to work on their farms, come back into the cities, close the gates, and they were protected for the night. And so you can imagine here is a city and the walls are, are broken down. He says that's the way a person is who has no self-control, who simply seeks to do as he pleases when he pleases no as long as he wants to. So it's a great danger to us. When the rich young ruler came to Christ, Jesus made it clear that it, there was a need that he sell all that he had. Now that's, I, hope, I wish people would miss the point there. The thing in that man's life that was keeping him from Christ was his material goods and he had more than the average person. <coughs> to somebody else it may be something else. It may be family, it may be friends, it may be education. It may be job, whatever. Whatever comes between you and your God and your service to him is an idol. So we have a lot of idolatry going on today. 
And so self can be one of the biggest idols there is. And he told the rich and ruler, sell all you've got. Take up your cross and follow me. Cross is always representative as dying to the world. Dying to the world. And that's to be done daily by the one who would serve God faithfully. Remember the appetites to be gratified of the fleshly body are described as lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or vainglory of life. Sometimes, and today most of the time, we use the word lust to be just a, an inordinate, unlawful craving for something of the flesh to be desired. Lust can also just mean the natural desire for something that comes from your physical body. There are things that are necessary in order for us to live on this earth in a fleshly body that we must have. Your, your body desires that. Try going without water any length of time. And you'll see your body lusts after water. So in that sense, the word lust is not a bad thing. But when it becomes bad is when we seek it to the point of violating God's law to get it. And that's where self comes in as the enemy to us because in gratifying what old self wants, then many times uh, we're driven, as most people are, to get it contrary to the will of heaven. The question I want to ask you this morning, and it needs to be a, a question we ask every day, helps to see whether we're growing in our knowledge and practice of the truth to ask it. Who is in control of your life? Who is in control of your life? Listen to what Paul said to the churches of Galatia and see if it doesn't have a bearing on answering that question, who is in control of your life. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, listen to what he said. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. Then he says, but if ye be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Of course, there was a problem with doctrine, false doctrine, that had been taught among the churches of Galatia. And that was that to be saved by Christ, you not only must obey the gospel, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. Paul deals with that in showing that these false teachers are just that, false teachers, why they're false, and why that's a corruption of the gospel. He even says in chapter 5 and verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And that pretty well ought to sum up why that the law, as it accomplished what God wanted it to accomplish, could not save a man like the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel alone is all that's necessary to save a person from their sins. Uh, to put that person into Christ when one completes their obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.27 and Acts 2 verse 38. But you'll notice that he's telling them that there's a seesaw here. And, and let's just not stop there. Let's see Paul say something about himself in Romans 7 in verse uh, 15. And see if you don't see yourself in it. Romans 7 and verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Let's pull it down to something that uh, makes it very easy in understanding what he's saying here about one's efforts to serve God. Anybody here ever been on a physical diet? That is, to lose weight. It is tempting to eat that which you know is not good for you if you're going to lose weight. So everybody, of course, not seeking to gratify the lust of the flesh in this case, on a diet, never, 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 never gives in to the desire for that bite of candy or that bread or whatever it might be. Now, it's not a matter of you knowing better. It's a matter of the appetite. <laughs> and so he says, in the flesh, because we are fleshly, there's a fight. 
We either live on the level of the Spirit, that is, following spiritual instruction, that is, the truth of God's Word, or we're going to live otherwise. Now, the child of God, in becoming a Christian, has crucified the flesh and lust thereof. What does that mean? That's why he says, take up your cross daily and follow Him. It means that your whole purpose in life, your whole goal in life, your whole reason for existing is to serve God. Well, service is submitting to somebody else's will and pleasing that somebody else by doing His will. The epitome of selflessness is Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. As a human being, He did not want to undergo, and no human being would the ordeal and the agony and the shame of the cross. But there was a higher thing there than the flesh to escape that. There was a desire to obey God, to bring His flesh in subjection, His appetites in subjection, to the will of heaven. So not my will, but thine be done, He prays. And so He gave us the pattern of life. And thus, in living the Christian life, we know the mind of Christ as to how to be like Christ and thought, word, and action is revealed in words that we know his la uh, that is His last will and testament. If you control self, you win. If self controls you, you lose. If God is in control of you, you win. And that raises some question, how is it that I can be under the control of God? How can I champion over myself? How can I have the proper view of myself and thus deal with me as I ought to? Well, go back with me to the Galatian epistle. And look with me in that same chapter. And let's look at verses 17 and 18. Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But, in contrast to that reality, if ye be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now he's contrasting the law of Moses that these Judaizing teachers had come along and said, you must be circumcised to keep the law to be a faithful Christian. And he's saying, you don't go back to that. Now if you go through the book of Hebrews and even here in the book of Romans, you'll see that he, uh, by inspiration, talks about the law as that which was of the flesh. Because it wasn't to accomplish in man what the gospel system would. It was made for a fleshly Israel, an actual nation among all other physical nations. It accomplished what God intended it to accomplish, but it never was to accomplish what the New Testament system was accomplished. It was to bring you to the New Testament system where the real teaching of being godly and Christ-like can be found. So when you try to go back under the law of Moses sit it for a fleshly thing, then you're, you're fleshly. You're thinking on that level. Well, I don't know of anybody here who would try to go back under the law as these false teachers had taught the Galatian Gentiles they should in order to be saved by Christ. But I do know we're the same human beings they were. And I do know we have as human beings the same fleshly appetites and that they're very strong. Brethren, to say the least, our culture is out of control. Now that's one of those things when I can say that, everybody say, it sure is. It's worse now than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. But why is a culture or a society out of control? The people <laughs> that make it up are out of control. More people today are more ignorant of the Bible and less interested in the Bible. I'm speaking just of America. More people today oppose God and Christ and the Bible and, and for that matter anything religious. Well, they're left to themselves. Do you think self being as important it is that, as it is to any one of us that if you deny the controlling 
impact of the gospel system, the Bible even in general, uh, that people are going to live closer to the godly morals that are presented in the Bible or further away from it. It's obvious. Uh, people are out of control. The culture is out of control because the people are out of control. And the more people you have out of control of God, then the worse it's going to be. Just that way. How do I know that? Well, I can read the description God gives us of the world before the great Noah flood. And the Bible says of those folks, their mind was only on evil continually. Well, evil is contrary to the will of heaven to be done in the lives of men. That's where their minds were. You see it growing in America as to whether it's got to that state of affairs and to that extreme, I don't know. I doubt it. But it's trying to get there. How much longer and how much further we have to go before we could be described like the culture before the flood, I don't know. I don't have to know to know what I need to do to control myself and you need to do to control yourself. So how do I get control of myself? Well, let me go back over it again. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. In other words, what the spirit wants, the Holy Spirit wants, is not what the body wants. Not what the flesh wants. Well, look in verse 18. Well, what do we do about that? Well, if we're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, you tell me how we're going to be led by the third person of the Godhead today. Is there going to be just some sort of mystic, uh, better felt than told bump that shakes us up and, and gives us the heebie-jeebies and we think it's some sort of holy jump and, boy, we had such a good experience, it must be God in my life. It's the very same thing. Paul writes this letter by inspiration of the Holy Spirit concerning how the Galatians ought to live and they must take their minds and subject self to this letter. That's the way it is. If the Spirit's going to have any control over me, that is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. If God's going to control me, He has to do it in partnership with me because I'm a free moral agent. I must be willing to submit to the instructions of God through the Spirit by the inspired writers, thus the New Testament must hold control of my life. We want what we want when we want it. I've used this illustration so much. We come into this world that way. You and you mothers. And the way it's worked over the last few years, you mothers to be. You have to think about that in a little while, buddy. When you have a new baby, I, I want to know how much it's concerned about itself. Then I want to ask you a question. How much is it concerned about mom and daddy? When it wakes up screaming at 2 o'clock in the morning, tell it to go back to sleep, and you'll take care of it at about 7 o'clock. That's going to work, isn't it? That baby wants it now. He wants that appetite satiated. He wants it right then. And he doesn't care one hoot <laughs> about you and what you want and the need of sleep and you've got to get up and work tomorrow. I want it now. And I'll upset this whole house until I get it. Did I just describe reality? Now we come here that way and every one of us, do you think that when you were just an infant that you caused problems like that in your household? Well, you know you did. Every one of us did. Well, then what changes as we go through the years and, quote, grow up physically? Well, I'm afraid in our lifetime that it's not changing as much as it did a generation ago because the parents just aren't training and teaching and involved in the multitudinous details and taking the time to do that. How does, besides the normal growth and development, for the brain and mentally and physically, how does a person change? How does a person learn to control himself? Because we've already stated, and it's the truth, that our culture is out of control because the people who make up our culture are out of control. Oh, there's always been people out of control. 
We're talking about enough people, enough leavening in the whole of the country that it makes the whole country go out of control. So the society is out of control because people aren't doing what they need to to learn to exercise self-control. So I'm my biggest problem. If you're going to become a Christian, you're going to have to stand in front of that mirror and say, I'm my biggest problem in doing anything that's right. If you've been taught by example, by just the way everything's functioning, that you don't really have any responsibility at all for the way you are. And whatever problem comes upon you, it's somebody else's fault. Now there's what you see permeating our society today to a degree that it didn't 50 years ago. And even more so 100 years ago. There's this attitude, I can't help it. Well, just tell yourself every time a problem comes, not my fault, I can't help it. And when it comes to sin, the transgression of God's law, what do you think you're going to think about that if that's the way you view things? It's not my fault I'm like I am. Galatians 5 and verse 24 Paul gives us the remedy, and it's right where we started. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That's describing what it is, listen, to be a faithful child of God. If you haven't, as a member of the Lord's church, put your affections and desires, pride, haughtiness, well, I don't know what all it is that fits this life and peculiar to the flesh, and what the world champions and says is great. If you haven't put that to death, separating yourself from it by your own will, and joined yourself to the truth of God's word, laboring to bring your life into subjection to that, heaven's not going to be home. While the very process of becoming a Christian demonstrates that disposition. The Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, is preached to you. That enlightens you about sin, uh, uh, how it separates you from God, what it is to be lost from God, the consequences of sin. But at the same time, it teaches you that God's made provision for that sin and that you're responsible for realizing that and that you learn the truth of the Bible. And out of that truth... Your confidence in God and Christ and the gospel system is increased through the knowledge that is in the word. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The importance of that cannot be overly stated. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11 and 1. It means without this confidence and trust built by the truth of God, the revelation of God's mind, for us to understand why we're here and what we're to be doing here, and that self is to be brought in subjection to the will of God, that God's will is going to be done, then how can we ever become more like Christ? How can we ever view things as God views them? How can we ever be faithful? Uh, look at verse 6 of Hebrews 11. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must, it's imperative, no other way around it, must believe in Him. That's what He must do. He that comes to God must. Faith is a must. There is no remission of sins even becoming a Christian unless your faith in God is correct. Now your faith is going to be correct only when your knowledge of God's Word is correct because faith comes by the Word. If your knowledge of the Word of God is wrong, your faith can't be right. That's the reason we're taught so much about rightly dividing the Word of Truth and studying it and getting in our mind. That's why people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because without the knowledge they can't have the faith that is essential for one to become a Christian. So even in becoming a Christian, there is the will to know and do God's will. Well, guess what? One dies to self when one sees that one must repent of one's sins. 
No longer after repenting is one interested in gratifying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride or vainglory of life. Those things in your mind you've said, I don't want to be a part of that. It, it's, it's going to end with this life. It, it's all this world. It's temporary. It's, it's so necessary to live in this world, but it's got to be regulated by the truth of God who knows how all to live in this world. And, and that God said, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Miss that, and you won't deny yourself like the Scriptures say you ought to, and die to the things of this world. Separate yourself from it and live according to the things of God. It is an imperative that you crucify yourself. Every day, spiritually speaking, you nail yourself by your will to a cross. Now, what does that mean? It means that you put your appetites of the flesh to death. Well, that alone won't do it. It means then that you fill your life with the knowledge of truth from the New Testament that tells me how to live. Now, the psychologist or the psychiatrist is not going to tell you that. The most of them. The secular psychologist. They're going to say that you ought to pamper yourself. That really where the hang-up is, is a religion that tells you you ought to crucify your flesh. That's where your hang-up is. Because you see, you're desiring to do these things, and you're stopping yourself from doing it. Well, lo and behold, that's to a great extent, that's right. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. A person who wears the name of Christ, a member of the church, wants to do what the New Testament says. But as long as they're so attached to the flesh and its appetite, uh, it's just a seesaw. <laughs> it wins one time, and that is, the spirit wins one time, another time it doesn't. You're not fully dead to the world. And that's what's being said here. If you look at verse 20, you'll see, that is in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, you'll see something. You're going to see that Christ is the answer. But how is he the answer? In Galatians 2 and verse 20, you want to know why Paul accomplished so much in faithful service to God? Listen to what he said. He didn't hesitate to say this about himself to these churches of Galatia and making up the New Testament so to every Christian that would ever read it. I am crucified with Christ. Christ. Do you think that it would be good if we could make that statement about ourselves? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Then what's the conclusion? In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by, well, lo and behold, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what he just said? I'm faithful to the Lord every day of my life. You know what faithfulness is? There it is. Anybody that says, I'm faithful to the Lord, but cannot write about himself or herself what Paul did in verse 20, must conclude they're not faithful. Faithfulness involves I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How does Christ live in me? Well, it's when His mind is in you and you think and act like Christ. But where can I go get that? The last will, will and testament of Christ. And so we sing... Songs designed to invite people to obey the gospel and remind them what's necessary. When we sing, let him have his way with thee. What do you think that song is saying where it come from? It's saying you can't have your way and go to heaven. You can't live on the level of the flesh and go to heaven. You can't even get forgiveness of sins and live on the level of the flesh. For you'll never truly obey the gospel of Christ. Before each one of us there's a throne. 
representing rule and power or kingdom. And, and there's also a cross. Every one of us, that's the case. Now, which will we choose? We must dethrone self and be able then to say with Paul by choosing the way of the cross. That reminds you of another song. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on by the way of the cross. The way of the cross leads home. I wish we'd think more about those songs and know what they're really saying to us and what we're saying to others when we sing them. So I must choose the cross, do I? Sometimes in talking, it fits other areas of life, but sometimes in, in talking to people who are about to be married or maybe they just got married, relative to the throne and the cross being set before them, if they're going to have a happy marriage and all the Bible teaches marriage to be husband, wife, responsibilities, and parents when the children come along, I say, here's the first thing that you ought to have after the marriage ceremony. And of course, they're thinking, honeymoon, honeymoon, honeymoon. Well, yeah, that's true. But really, you ought to have two funerals, two funerals right after the ceremony. It's a funeral of self. The husband dies to self and the wife dies to self. And according to the teaching of heaven regarding the responsibility of the husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, and finally parents to the children, then they turn to the Bible. Let's see, we sang another song, Give Me the Bible, Star of Dadness Giving, Tooth Year of the Wanderers, Lone and Tempest Tossed. If you're going to fall self, She's going to follow what she wants to do, and you're going to follow what you want to do. And the kids come along, they're going to follow what they want to do, regardless of what you and her want to do. Now, that's the reason the society and the culture is out of control. And that's why even the church is not all the church ought to be, and why there's apostasy in the church with people trying to justify living as they please and trying to say, but we're members of the church, so... If we do as members of the church what is of the world, then because we're members of the church, that sanctifies whatever it is because we're members of the church. We did it, and so it's not like the worldly person sinning. Uh, when we're members of the church do it, it's not sin because we're members of the church. We must die to self. We must die to self. And let me just pull it into the church now even more so as elders. We must die to the self as preachers, as Bible class teachers, as deacons. You know what the danger is to our elders and any elders in the whole brotherhood? They get to be elders and now in their mind they say, we can get it done like I want it. <laughs> and whether you've got two, three, five, seven, whatever, if the attitude in there is that we'll run the show and their job is to do what we tell them, Running on whose, whose will is running what? Well, bring it back to the husband. I'm the head of this house, and I'm going to run it. And she's going to jump when I cry jump and stay up there as long as I tell her to stay there and hit the floor when I tell her. That's where it's going to be. If that's the disposition of mind, it's not the disposition of the truth of the gospel relative to how we view things in life. Whether elders or preachers or deacons or husband, wives, parents, Bible school teachers, yes, we're under authority. And if we love God, we keep His commandments. But notice that if we love God, we keep whose commandments? So elders are trying to be what the New Testament, the will of Jesus Christ, the chief elder, says they ought to be. Husbands, the head of their house, are trying to be what the chief, if you please, the head is saying we ought to be. And same with the wife. And when children are trained by the parents and old enough to understand, then they know they're not to live as they want to live. 
But they have an obligation in the role they're playing. And so it is with deacons, and on and on you go. We're all joined together, and we're of the same mind and the same judgment. Does that sound like somebody said something like that in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 1.10? And we're unified under one head, one authority. We're not here to seek ourselves and do as we please, whether we're preachers or elders or deacons. We're here to let God's will be done in our life. Elders collectively get together and decide what's best for the church. Hey, you know something? It may not be best for any one of the elders, but it's best for the church. Think that can ever be? It works better for the church than maybe any one of us. Well, what about the preacher of the gospel? Well, guess what? If he's loyal to Christ and all that that means, he's faithful and dedicated, he will preach sermons that aren't necessarily the best thing for him, but is the truth that the people need to hear. And you just gird yourself up and step up there and do it because it's right. Does that sound like Christ in the garden? It's right. You deny yourself. You crucify yourself. You choose the Lord's way. Self-control is simply walking by the Spirit as the Spirit instructs us. Ephesians 6 and verse 17, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. But it sort of tie in with what you preached to a little while back on a Wednesday night. I thought of this because it has to do with control of self. And it's... It's attributed to Will Rogers. And he did have a lot of sayings that were marvelous. And we usually think about bridling the tongue, speaking, and speaking as the oracles of God, speak the truth of God. But he made this statement, and this sort of ties in with James as far as the tongue is concerned. Never miss a chance to shut up. And you're sitting there saying, does he believe that about his preaching? Okay, we're through. If you need to come to Jesus, come while we stand and sing.